Okay, here we go. Um, BC 10.6, BC number two, multiple choice packet. Uh, this one is going to focus on L'Hopital's rule and proper integrals, logistic growth, and some more serious stuff. So L'Hopital's rule um, says that uh, if now um, if if you have a limit and x approaches uh, some value b of f of x over g of x, and it gives you zero over zero or infinity over infinity, then uh, it says that the the original limit is going to equal a limit of the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom separately. Okay, it's not quotient rule, no quotient rule, okay, which is nice. Um, these are called indeterminate forms. Cannot so you can't determine the answer. So in other words, they are inconclusive, a term that we've been using quite a bit lately with series. Now on for response, you would need to technically say that since, sorry, since FB equals GB equals zero, then you're going to write this. Now, we can't say that the limit equals zero over zero equals this. Okay, if this happens, and this is the more proper way of stating it, then you can rewrite the original limit as this new limit. Um, there are some other <coughs> indeterminate forms that we've encountered. Um, so zero to infinity, infinity to zero, one to the infinity, infinity minus infinity are some of them. And um, you're probably not gonna see any like that on the AP test, probably be zero, zero, infinity over infinity, but I think we'll throw like one in here for um, prior. So what I want you guys to try and do is um, we'll probably do like half these problems together. So I'll have you try them first and then and then we'll try them together. So I want you to try one, three, and five on this front page. So go ahead, pause the video, try them, then unpause it, I'll go over them, and then we'll go on to the next page. Okay, so go ahead, try them on your own. First step is we just plug h equals zero in, and we get e to the zero minus one over two times zero, which is one minus one, which gives you zero over zero. So, we're going to say that this limit equals the limit as h goes zero, the derivative of the top. Now we're taking the derivative with respect to the variable that is involved, h. So it's gonna be e to the h over two. And so then we get e squared over two. Sorry, e to the zero over two when we plug zero in, and that gives you one half. So there you go. Kind of a straightforward L'Hopital's rule. Uh, number three says the third derivative of the function f is continuous on the interval zero to four values for f and its first three derivatives at x equals two are given in the table. What is this limit? Now, if we plug two in, we get f of two over two minus two squared. Now, f of two is uh, f of two is zero over zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the limit as x approaches two, and we do the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom. Now we're gonna take the derivative of f, and just say f prime. So now when you plug two into that, you get f prime of two over two times two minus two, and f prime of two is zero, and two minus two is zero, so we get it again. So L'Hopital's rule can be used repeatedly um, so we'll do it again. Derivative of the top is f double prime of x, and the derivative of the bottom is just 2. If you distribute this, it would be 2x minus 4. Um, and so now f 
double prime of two over two, f double prime of two is five, over two is five halves. So the answer is B. So kind of a different way of doing that. Number five is one of those other indeterminate forms. So I'll remind you guys of some of the you know, interesting creative ways we dealt with it. So if we, cosecant is one over sine. So this is gonna give you one to infinity because one divided by a tiny number goes big, x goes to zero, it's one to infinity. So what we would do is we would uh, sort of create like a, a temporary function. I think sometimes we call it, we call it f of x equals uh, one plus two x uh, to the cosine x. And then the issue is trying to deal with this exponent that's infinity. So we gotta get the exponent out. And so the strategy we usually use to free up exponents is to take the natural log of both sides. So if you do that, um, um, sorry, if you do that, then you can use uh, log rules and bring it out front. So natural log of f of x equals cosecant x natural log of one plus two x. Now, if we uh, plug, um, if we take the limit right now, limit as x goes to zero of this new function natural log of f of x, then we get the limit as x approaches zero of cosecant zero, which is one over sine, right? So that's gonna be infinity times, and then, uh, it's gonna be infinity times zero, right? Which is not zero, it's not infinity because it's not technically zero, it's something tiny and something huge. So they might kind of balance each other out and give you something like one or five, or the infinity will outpower the tiny terms or the tiny terms might be so small compared to the infinite terms that it goes to zero. Um, but what we need to do is get one of those kind of classic indeterminate forms, zero over zero or infinity over infinity. So this is something we'd run to sometimes in our strategy was to then rewrite it, um, kind of manipulate this to where we got, like that's going to zero. And like this one's actually not too bad because we could just rewrite it like this, right? And you would get, um, Natural log of one, zero over zero. So we can't do L'Hopital's rule until we get that zero over zero, infinity over infinity. So now we can do L'Hopital's rule. Um, we haven't taken any derivatives yet. Um, just been trying to manipulate this to get that. So derivative of the top, one over uh, one plus two x times two chain rule over cosine x. And so now if you plug zero into that, you get two over one and then cosine zero is one and you get two. Now that's not the final answer. You gotta be careful because this is the limit of the natural log of f of x. We want the limit uh, of f of x. So what that means is we have to uh, exponentiate the natural log of f of x. We can take the limit of that so that those cancel out. And so then that means we, we over here we get E squared. So I don't know if you guys remember those fun problems. I don't think you're gonna have to deal with that on the AP test though, um, those kind of crazy ones. Let's go to the next page. So that was your reptiles rule, a little quick review. Um, and then on the next page, we'll talk about improper integrals. So there's uh, improper means in general that we're in integrating with something going to infinity. So you could have endpoint discontinuities. 
and that's where you have like an infinity um, or and, and for those what we do is we just we approach them as limits okay um, and then the other one is where you have vertical um, uh, asymptotes or something in the middle of your function and the function blows up and so we call those interior discontinuities or endpoint discontinuities I guess too because it could happen at the edge so these are uh, vertical asymptotes uh, so the graph blows up or the other issue for improper integrals is if you integrate to infinity uh, in the limit so um, generally these are just regular integration definite integrals but then you have to use some limits at the end um, so I want you guys to try seven nine seven and nine so pause the video try seven and nine unpause it We'll check your answer, make sure you understand it, and you guys can do six and eight on your own later. So go ahead and try it. Number seven, I we got to just do regular uh, integration first. So I'm going to do u substitution, which is perfect. I get that x dx, and I want the two. So then I get this uh, one half du over u squared which is one half integral of u to the negative two du, which is one half u to the negative one over negative one power rule, which is negative one over two u. And then the limits are one to infinity. Now, technically, if they're free response, I would write the limit uh, I'd write this in front. The limit as b goes to infinity, and then you put a b here. Now, multiple choice, we can be lazy. Um, so we get negative 1 over 2 times infinity minus negative 1 over 2 times 1. Be careful that subtract the second term and already has a negative, so it becomes plus. This goes to 0, and your answer is, uh, let's see, did I make a mistake somewhere? Oh, shoot. I forgot to replace the u with 1 plus x squared. Classic move. Uh, so that's going to be 2. That's going to be 1 fourth. And they totally put 1 half on there, man. I almost got cut. Now, if it blows up, we technically don't write that the answer is infinity or negative infinity. The technical answer would be it diverges, divergent, doesn't, does not exist. Okay, number 9. And number 9 is more just throwing something in that kind of makes us think of that. So this is this is like a series question. In fact, it's a looks like a geometric series. It's a power series, but then we're going to use it for f of 1. So that means if you plug 1 in for x, then you're going to get sine squared of 1. And that's just some number, right? Um, and uh, and then this is a geometric series because it's just raising it to a power. It's times itself, times itself, times itself. Um, so it's a geometric series. We got to make sure it actually converges. The absolute value of R would be the absolute value of sine one squared, including the squared. Um, and th this is where a calculator comes in handy. So uh, sine of 1 is that uh, squared is 0 0.70807. So this is less than 1. So it does converge. That's the criteria. And then um, so the sum, what this equals is the sum. So f of 1 equals the sum, which equals the a over 1 minus r. a is the first term. So if you plug 1 in here, you get sine 1 squared over 1 minus the r value is sine 1 squared. So it's going to be whatever that is. So um, we could do uh, sine 1 
squared divided by parentheses one minus parentheses sine one close close squared close you get 2.425 or 2.426 so there we go anyways so serious fun thrown in the next part of problems is going to be logistic growth so logistic growth is a more sort of realistic uh growth model and it goes towards in the carrying capacity um and mostly you're going to just need to know these basic things the the, the max growth rate happens at inflection point which is always half the carrying capacity um the Differential equation, dp or dy, dt equals kp. So it has the exponential growth part of it. That's that's the differential equation for just straight up exponential growth. And then it has this limiting factor. As you get close to the carrying capacity, this will get closer and closer to zero, which will make the, the slope flatten out um, as we go to infinity. Um, we derived the logistic growth model from this. It was a bit of work. Um, I don't think you're going to need to use this on the AP test specifically, but maybe on this worksheet you might. It was uh, m over 1 plus a e to the negative m k t. a is just a constant, like constant of integration. Um, and so with those, we can you know solve problems. So um, try number 10. Maybe you could try it first, and then we'll talk about it. Um, So it says uh, the rate of change dpdt of the number of people in ocean beach is modeled by the logistic differential equation. The maximum number of people out on the beach is 1,200. So this is your carrying capacity, right? At 10 a.m., the number of people on the beach is 200. So they've given you some initial condition and is increasing at a rate of 400 people per hour. So this is your dpdt at 10 a.m. Um, so maybe we'll use that to help us. It says, uh, which of the following differential equations describes the equation? So we know that the PDT uh, equals K uh, P M minus P. So we already have the M, right? The carrying capacity. We got to figure out what the K value is. So you need at least one value to figure out the K value. So we're going to say, well, um, the, uh, the, the, the derivative, the PDT, uh, equals 400. It says when, uh, at 10 AM, when there's 200 people on the beach. So that's your P value at a time. And, um, so equals 400 K times the amount of people is 200. That's that. The uh, carrying capacity is 1,200, and then 200 people again. And so I think we could use this to solve for k um, without having to use without having to use the logistic growth uh, model, which is nice. So this is going to be 400 equals. That's going to be uh, 1,000. So 200 with two more zeros after k divide by. Uh, 20,000, okay, um, that's going to be k equals uh, 1 over 50 or 0 0.02 if you want to write it as a decimal, um, all right, so now we got to pick the right one, um, so I don't think that one makes sense, we need I mean, we could just write it right now. Let's just write it. It's going to be dp dt equals k, 1 over 50 times p, uh, m, uh, the carrying capacity is 1,200 minus p. Now, we might not find one that looks exactly like that. We might have to manipulate it. But um, actually, you know what? I think I might have made a mistake here. No, 20,000. Did I do all this work right? Um, Thousand times two hundred. Oh wait, wait. A thousand has three zeros. There should be one more zero here. 
So this is going to be 1 over 500. So, um, okay, so 1 over 500. So 1 over 500, P, 12 over, so there it is. That's C. Okay, let's take a look at the next page. Um, so here's a little section on series, which I'm sure we could use a little more uh, work on. So we'll take some little notes up here at the top. Now we've been doing series recently, so it should be fresh in your head, but not necessarily something you feel totally confident with yet. So, um, uh, let's see. There's a, there's a bunch of different tests for num uh, convergence and divergence. So the number series, so these generally apply to number series. And so we could go through a quick list of the tests. There's the nth term test. And the key is here is that you need to name these. Um, the limit as, you got to name them and you got to show the work. Limit as n goes to infinity of the nth term. If it doesn't equal zero, it diverges. Okay, so it's a test for divergence. If it does equal zero, then that's inconclusive. So it's not really helpful if it's a converging series. It's not going to be enough ammunition to actually make that call. Uh, geometric series. So you can use a geometric uh, series test. And so you have to recognize those geometric series and the absolute value of R has to be less than one uh, converges, right? Um, now, if it equals one, it might, it, it depends. If it's power series, it might converge. Uh, so in general though, If the uh, absolute value bar is greater than or equal to, it diverges for a number series. Um, then we had a P series test, which is where the harmonic series comes from. So if P is greater than one, it converges. Uh, so if P is less than or equal to one, it diverges. Um, and P equals one is the harmonic series. Probably one of the most famous diverging series. Okay. Um, alternating series. Now P series is something that's like one over N to a power. And and the P's in the denominator, and that's considered a positive p-value. Uh, alternating series, alternating series test. So there's a lot of alternating series, and they they will converge better than non-alternating series. And if the limit as n goes to infinity of their nth term goes to zero, then that actually that converges. That's conclusive. Um, the ratio test is based off the idea that each next term needs to be smaller than the previous term. So we sort of, without too much effort, derive this, that um, an a and the absolute value of the next term has to be. So, I mean, if you said, if you said uh, the n plus one term needs to be smaller than the nth term, and then you, um, divided this over here, you get one, you get, oh, okay, well, the limit of the n plus one term over the nth term has to be less than one. Okay, so if it's less than one, it converges. If it equals one, it's inconclusive. Inconclusive. And if it's greater than one, it diverges for sure. So that's the ratio test. We use that to find uh, integral uh, interval of uh, convergence for power series. There's the integral test, which is what we use to figure out P series tests. And it says uh, if you match up a, a function in terms of x and and integrate it as an improper interval, and it converges, um, then your series n equals zero to infinity of f of n uh, also 
uh, converges. And then it also works the other way that if this one diverges, then this one diverges. Now, there are some requirements. It has to be an all positive function. It has to be continuous. It has to be getting smaller. Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense to try it. Um, there's the comparison test, which seems kind of like, seems kind of hard to use. I wouldn't use it if one of these other ones worked. Um, but the comparison test says that if you have um, if you have a series that term for term is smaller than another series term for term that converges, then yours has to converge too because it's smaller. Or if you have one that's bigger than it, then it diverges. Now, a common kind of situation is you might have, you know, some converging series that in, in the way you figure out that yours is smaller is that there's something extra in the denominator, like a plus one or something, then yours is going to converge also. So what you're usually looking for is you take a, a series that, that if you kind of simplified some of the extra terms out will look like a series that you could actually determine. And if it has extra terms of denominator, then ours is going to be uh, bigger. Now, if it, if it was something like, where you have stuff and then ours is bigger. And one of the reasons it might be bigger is because it has the same stuff in here, but you end up taking away one to make it, make the denominator smaller, which makes the whole term bigger. So if this diverges, then this is also going to diverge. So I think we'll have an opportunity to try that um, a couple times. Um, there's this other idea of absolute convergence. And that's kind of usually handy if you want to use like the integral test or something like that, which you're only allowed to use on an all positive series, then maybe you just force all terms to be positive and test that. And if that converges, then yours will converge too, because that's like a worst case scenario. Um, so it says if n equals zero to infinity, the absolute value of a n converges. So you force all the negative terms to be positive then the original version that had positive and negative terms, which are going to work against each other and cancel each other out, for sure converges. In fact, we say it converges absolutely. Now, if this all positive version doesn't converge, that doesn't mean ours doesn't converge. It's inconclusive. But if ours does converge still without that, then we'd say it converges conditionally. So why don't you guys try um, 12 and 13, pause the video and try 12 and 13 and then unpause it and we'll, we'll see how you do. Okay, so number 12, which of the following series converge? Now these Roman numeral problems are always kind of a hassle, but one thing you might do is sometimes rewrite these uh, like this is the same thing as one over n to the one half. And you say, oh, that's P series, right? So P series test, if it were for response, you'd have to write all the stuff. P series test, P equals one half is smaller than um, or equal to one, then it diverges, right? So that one's out. So which of the series converge? So anything with one is out, okay. And then this one, this one's kind of tricky. He's like, well, what is that? I mean, so sometimes starting to write the terms out might help. This is this is three to the first over one factorial plus three to the second over two factorial plus three to the third over three factorial. And what you might think of is like, oh, this is like x to the first over one factorial plus x squared over two factorial plus x cubed over three factorial. And that should look familiar. This is e to the x. So that means that this is e to the three, which means it actually converges and it converges to e to the three. So two is good. So none's out, three's out. Three alone is out. This one's out though. So it's really down between b and e. So we gotta figure out three. Now three, uh, three, and by the way, if we did ratio test on this one, it would have worked. So if you're like, I don't know if I would recognize E, well, let's try ratio test. Limit as 
it's not alternating, it's not geometric, it's not power, so you can't use any of those. Let's try ratio test. 3 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial uh, divided by n fact, uh, multiplied by the reciprocal. And so um, you guys should be good at simplifying factorial. So this is going to equal the limit as n goes to infinity of 3 over n plus 1, which goes to 0, which is less than 1, which converges. It doesn't have to go to zero. It has to go to something less than one. So if whatever it goes to, I always make sure I compare it to, you know, state the criteria. So that was just number two a second way. On this, this looks like a constant being raised to power. This is geometric, isn't it? So we just got to figure out well, what's the absolute value of R. Well, it's the absolute value of E over pi, which is about 2.7 over 3.1 which is definitely less than one, right? So it converges by the geometric series test. So two and three converge, so the answer is E. Um, <clears throat> all right, 13, which of the following series diverge? So be careful, because sometimes they ask for diverge and sometimes they ask for converge. And you could just always accidentally look for converging ones. Now, this first one, Let's let's jump to the second one. The second one, that's a geometric series, right? So if it were a free response, you'd write geometric series test very thoroughly, name it. You'd say the absolute value of R equals the absolute value of 6 sevenths equals 6 sevenths, which is less than 1, which converges. And then you could actually find the sum of it too if you want. So this one diverges. I'm sorry, this one converges, but we're looking for diverging. So that one's out. Anything to 2 is out. Okay, um, this one right here is an alternating series. Um, in fact, I think it's an alternating harmonic series, which you could state, but um, it is an alternating series. So we could do limit as uh, n goes to infinity or k, I guess, in these cases, whatever. Negative one over k over that goes to zero, which means it converges. As a, in term test, that's inconclusive. As also in series test, that converges. So that one converges. So that one's out. So anything with three is out. It looks like it's just going to be none by process elimination. But this one up here, there's no really a like direct test. But you you might say, oh well, that's that's close to two over k squared, which is really just a p series, right? So you could say, okay, well this is just like. The series two, you could bring the two out in front if you want. Uh, one over k squared, and uh, it's a p series, and p equals two, which is bigger than one, which converges, right? And our terms, because they have an extra plus one, means each of each term is going to be a the denominator is going to be a little bigger, which makes your answer a little smaller. So ours is for sure smaller than this other series. And that one converges, so ours has to converge also. So that's a that's an easy application of the comparison test. Um, is by looking at something that has just like a little extra term or something, and like kind of ignoring it and saying, well, what happens with that series, and how does our series compare to it? Um, let's see. So next page we have Taylor series and Taylor polynomials. And then McLaurin series is a special case of those. So we'll take some quick little notes up here at the top. Um, so a lot of times we refer to the center of the series as A. So A equals the center. And so a Taylor um, series, we'd say Taylor, usually capital T, and then you put the zero with you, you evaluate the zeroth derivative at the center, and then it's the x value minus the center to the zeroth power, uh, exponent over zero factorial. And then the first derivative, x minus a to the first power over one factorial, and then the second derivative at the center, x minus a to the second power over two factorial, and on and on and on. Now that this is just one, so you do get that though right there. Now, this whole thing right here is called the coefficient of that term. 
the coefficient of that term. And I think people a lot of times mistake just the derivative uh, value being the coefficient, but it involves the, the factorial in the bottom also. And it keeps going. And the general pattern is the nth derivative at the center, x minus a to the nth power over n factorial. Now, a Taylor polynomial is when you just say, well, I'm just going to take the fifth order Taylor polynomial. And so then that would just be up to the fifth power. And then you trunk it, you stop it. And that's you know kind of realistic. Now, a McLaurin series has a center value at zero. And there's a bunch of McLaurin series that we probably should either memorize or know how to get quickly. Uh, memorize e to the x, sine x, cosine x, uh, easily come from these ones. These are the odd terms. These are the even terms of e to the x, but they're alternating. Uh, 1 over 1 minus x, that's the most basic power series with the r value of x, natural log of 1 plus x, or any kind of version of that, inverse tangent of x. And those are some common ones. I wouldn't memorize those because you usually get slightly different changes in them. And I would just integrate them. Usually you get, get those by integrating. And this one I just treat as like a regular geometric series where this is the sum equals a over 1 minus r. So the a value is 1, r value is x. Um, so why don't you guys try 15 and 18. 15 and 18. <clears throat> So, and pause the video, and then try it, and then, so this, this one says, let f be the function given by this, it's a Taylor, it's a third degree Taylor polynomial centered about x equals 2. Now, we can't use those memorized McLaurin series unless they're for other McLaurin series that are also centered at 0. So, this is just kind of straight out, like, do the work, you know, like, well, the zeroth, you know, derivative uh, is is the original function, right? So then you can say, all right, well, the zeroth derivative at the center, which is 2, would be natural log of 3 minus 2 is natural log of 1 is 0. And the first derivative of x is 1 over what's inside. Don't forget the chain rule. And so then you say, okay, well, the first derivative at 2 is negative 1 over 3 minus 2 is negative 1 over 1 is negative 1. And then you can say, all right, the second derivative is, um, I mean, you could do quotient rule, or you could think of this as negative 3 minus x to the negative 1 power, and just do, power, uh, just do a power rule. So that would be positive 1, 3 minus x to the negative 2 times derivative of what's inside. So then the second derivative at the center would be negative 1 over 3 minus 2 squared, which would be negative 1 over 1 squared, which would be negative 1. Now, uh, is this enough to eliminate at least some of these answers? Um, so the first term drops out. That's why there is no just constant in front. The next one is negative 1 times x minus 1 to the first power over 1 factorial. First power over 1 factorial. This one, these don't have the negatives, so I think those ones are out, <clears throat> right? And then the next term is another negative one, negative one, x minus two over two factorial. That looks good, and because it's between A and B, right? So I think without even doing more work, but if you did, it, it should work out. So that's how you build a Taylor series Taylor polynomial, bunch of derivatives. 18, Taylor polynomial of degree 100 for the function about x equals 3. So that's the center. It's given by. So they're giving you it. And then they're giving you a pattern right here, right? Now, um, it says, what is the value of f 30th derivative of f? Well, you're going to want the one that has, now, this is this is kind of interesting. Um, 
So this would be like the zeroth derivative, maybe? Is this the zeroth derivative? And so it has, look at all these. This is two, four, six. So there's something extra in here. Like is this two times n, two times n, two times n. So this would be like a n equals two, n equals one, n equals three, right? To get that two n. So for 30, you know you're going to have an x minus 3 to the 2 times 30th power, right? And then you have the n value on the bottom, so you're going to have a 30 factorial. And you're going to have a negative 1 to the 30 plus 1, right? So it's definitely going to be negative 1 x minus 30, x minus 3 to the 60th power over 30 factorial. So I think... I think it's got to be this one. Oh, shoot. I think I made a mistake. Mm. Why is that not the right answer? Oh. Oh. Um. Okay. So we want 30th value I don't know this one's kind of weird and tricky um, I don't know I feel like uh, I think it's that I have something else written down. I have this one written down, but I think it's based off the idea that to get 30, then you need two times 15 right here to get 30. But because these should, these should match up to the derivative. So this is kind of like the, the only even terms. So we're missing the terms in between, right? So this is really like n equals one, this is n equals two, n equals three. So for 30, that means that n equals 15. So we want the one that's 15 plus one, two times 15 over 15 factorial. And so then that's gonna be negative, that's gonna be positive one to the x minus uh, 3 over 30 over 15 factorial. And then, oh, and then we got to plug 3 in to the x value. <laughs> plug 3 in to the x value. I don't know. This is just getting... Um... This is, this is what the term is, but it should equal, okay, here we go. This should equal the 30th uh, derivative times x minus 3 to the 30th power over uh, 30 factorial. So then those would cancel, and f of 30, this is, I know this is of, uh, of plugging three in, because that's what would go right here, would equal um, 30 factorial over 15 factorial. So, yeah, that was, that was kind of tough. Okay. Um, so then we have interval, so then we, then we deal with uh, power series. The power series either converge, they, where do they converge, where do they diverge? Number series, they either converge or diverge. So this is for power series. They have X's in them. And so what we're usually looking for is where do they converge? And so we do the ratio test, the limit as n goes to infinity of the A sub n plus one term over the A sub n term has to be less than one. 
and we use this um, to get to get an absolute value inequality that we then solve. Now, usually what we eventually get is we get x plus or minus like the center less than or equal to r or greater than or equal to r. And this is what we kind of end up solving typically. Now, the other thing for power series <clears throat> is error. And so in general, uh, we learned the Lagrange error bound. Lagrange error bound. We'll talk about the other one too in a second. So leave some room right here. Lagrange error bound. And what does what it says is the error is less than or equal to f to the n plus one derivative at some c value uh, x minus a to the n plus one power over n plus one factorial. So what this looks like, so we're we're looking for the error of if we take the nth degree nth order to the poly polynomial and truncate it. So this looks like the next term, but there's a C value that's between A and X. And this is where C gives the maximum value of the nth derivative um, for C between A and X. So we're looking for a worst case scenario. And so that's kind of the tricky part. The other kind of series is alternating series error bound. And it just says uh, the error is just less than the next term. And it was just based off this idea, alternate series goes like this, and this is what it's converging to. So this value right here, this is the error. But if you take the next term, which is all of that, then it's definitely, that's definitely bigger than the error. So the, the error is always gonna be less than that, that next term for an alternate series. Okay, um, why don't you guys try 20 and 22? So pause the video. These, this is one of the last, I think, long BC, you know, study group packets. <clears throat> so 20 says Taylor series for sine X about X equals zero. So that's the center. It's McLaurin series is this. If F is a function such that F prime of X equals sine X squared, then the coefficient of the X, the seventh, term in the Taylor series about x equals zero is what? Well, um, now what you need to realize is that they're saying, okay, well, f prime of x equals sine x squared. And the uh, McLaurin series for sine x squared, the, the McLaurin series for sine x is... Uh, well, they gave it to you right here. That's what they were giving you. Sometimes they'll do that, the memorized ones. So we're, we're going to plug an x squared in for each of those x's. All right. So then if we want to find f of x, they gave us f prime, we need to find f, then we're going to uh, integrate both sides. So that's going to give you um, x cubed over 3 minus x to the 6th. Sorry, x to the 6th would be x to the 7th over 7 times 3 factorial. Plus this would be x to the 10th, so it's going to be x to the 11th over 11 times 5 factorial, and so forth. They want the coefficient of the x to the seventh term, which is right there. So that's one over negative one over seven times three factorial, which is gonna be negative one over seven times six, which is gonna be negative one over 42. Okay. 22, the radius of convergence is what? 
and then it says, no, it says the radius of convergence is one. What is the interval of convergence? So this one, we could, you know, we could try the work, but the, the thing that we could kind of cut to is that the center is three, right? Based off this. So we can say, all right, well, the center is three. And if the radius of convergence is one, then the interval of convergence is from two to four. The only thing left to do is to check the endpoints, which we would have to check separately. For your response, you gotta write it, right? X equals two, and rewrite this the, the power series into a number series. It's gonna be negative one over uh, to the two n over n. And you might think, oh, that's alternating. Um, no, because this is the same thing as negative one squared to the n power so that's always going to be one. So this is really n equals one to infinity of one over n, which is a P series, which equals one, which diverges. It's a harmonic series, which diverges. So this one diverges. So for sure, we're not going to include two. So just based off process of elimination, it's either one of these, right? And once we figure out that two is not, there, then I think we go with D just because that's the only thing left. But you can check the other endpoint and it should, I mean, let's just do it for fun. X equals four, um, N equals one to infinity. If we plug a four in there, it's gonna be one over two N squared. And that's gonna be, that's gonna be a, a harmonic series also, or P series is the value of one and it diverges, so. For sure, uh, four doesn't belong there either. Last page. You guys can try a few more. Why don't you guys try 24, 25, 24, 25, and 27. So pause the video, try those problems, see if you can do them. Unpause, check your work figure out what's going on if you're getting it wrong. All right, so now I'm gonna try it. What are the values of X for which it converges? So this is, we're trying to find the interval of convergence. Interval of convergence. Now, one trick you could use because of multiple choice is say, okay, well, it's centered at X equals two. So it's gotta be one of these ones that two is right in the middle of, and the center of this one is zero, which is not two. The center of this one is zero, which is not two. The center of this one is two. The center of this one is two, and the center of this one is two. So it's for sure not A or B, just because of that. Um, but whatever, that doesn't, we st we're still, we still gotta do the work, I think. Or we could just check the endpoints right now. So then we could just skip the, the whole ratio test thing and and just check these two endpoints, negative one and five. So that'd be the quick way of doing it. So you can say, all right, endpoint X equals negative one. So then your power series becomes negative three to the N over N three to the N. Um, and that is, we can simplify it. And we could say, oh, well, that's one over n, and that's negative three over three to the n, which is negative one to the n over n. So that's an alternating harmonic series, or it's an alternating series, and you could show me the test. That one converges. So we want the one, we want one that includes negative one. So now it's down to d or e. So then we got to check x equals five. And your power series becomes three to the n over n three to the n, which becomes one over n, which is harmonic and diverges. So uh, it should include negative one, but not five. So our answer is E. That's taking advantage of multiple choice. Otherwise you would do the ratio test just to get to all this, and then you would do the work that we're doing right here. You say limit as 
n goes to infinity of the absolute value of x minus 2 to the n plus 1 power over n plus 1, 3 to the n plus 1, divided by the nth term, multiplied by the reciprocal, and then simplify these. So we have 3, x minus 2, so we get the limit as n goes to infinity of n over n plus 1 times x minus 2 over 3. That goes to 1. So we get x minus 2 over 3 is less than 1, which gives you x minus 2. Absolute value is less than 3. This is your radius of convergence. And then you got to solve this linear absolute value inequality. The way I like to do is use rule of postulate. And then you got to check the endpoints anyways. So 25. <clears throat> The coefficients of the power series um, here satisfy a sub 0 equals 5 and a sub n equals this. So the coefficients are just this part right here. And they're telling you some of the values for all n greater than 1. Okay. So the next coefficient equals the previous coefficient with this extra stuff in front. The radius of convergence of the series is what? Okay, well... Let's try, let's try the ratio test. The limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of the n plus one term. So the n plus one term, uh, n plus one over n, right? That's what we're doing. And so we're gonna do uh, two, you're gonna plug n plus one into that. So it's gonna be two n plus three, because you get two times n, two times the plus one is two, plus that one is three, over three n plus three minus two is plus two, and then a to the n, right? Okay, and then we're gonna divide by the a to the n term. So, I mean, we could, we could do this and then those go away. So this is what's left. And then we take the limit of that, and these are the dominant terms, and we get two-thirds, which is less than one. Uh, did I do that right? Two-thirds is less than one. Oh, shoot. These are just the coefficients. I forgot about this stuff. So we still need the x minus 2 to the n plus 1, x minus 2 to the n. And so then we still have, let me rewrite this, we have limit. We have two thirds times x minus two. That needs to be less than one. So x minus two, absolute value needs to be less than three halves. And we're just looking for the radius of convergence. So that's it right there. Three halves. Be careful. Sometimes they give you like the nth derivative. And then when you set up your ratio test, some people just put the derivatives in there and they forget about the factorial. They forget about the, the x minus the center to the power, which I almost did right there. Okay, last one uh, says the function f has derivatives of all orders for all real numbers. This is the fourth derivative. If the third degree Taylor polynomial of f about x equals zero is used to approximate f on the interval zero to one, zero to one, uh, what is the Lagrange error bound for the maximum error on the interval zero to one? So, um, Lagrange error bound, it might just be good to write it down, is the absolute value of the n plus one derivative at C, x minus a to the n plus one power over n plus one factorial. So for us, um, if we're going to do third degree Taylor polynomial, then that means n equals three. So we're going to do the fourth derivative at C. And then the value, the X value could be any X value here. So this one's a little different minus the center. Um, this is the center right here about X equals zero to the fourth power over a four factorial. And then they, so they gave you the fourth derivative. So we, there's a couple things we got to do. There's two worst case scenarios we got to do. We got to say, okay, what's the worst case scenario of e to the sine x? 
on zero to one. So you say, okay, well, and by the way, this is a graphing character problem. I know it didn't say that, so that could help you. So we could say, we could go in here and graph E to the sine X and go to the window and say zero to one and then do zoom fit. So I'm just going to graph the fourth derivative. Usually we sketch it. <clears throat> so we can change the window. Uh, negative one to three. So this is the graph of that from zero to one. So we want the worst value of it, which is clearly over here on the right side when you plug one in. So as far as that goes, we're going to do the, the C values between A and X um, is between zero and possibly one. It's worst case, right? And one is the worst. So we're going to plug E, we're going to plug one in for the sign. The other thing that we got to figure out though is what's the worst case of x. So they didn't just give us one x value, they give us an interval of x value. So it could be anything on there. What's the one that's going to give you the biggest result here? Well, one is. So that's your answer. So it's going to be e to the sine one uh, times four. So it's going to be e to the sine one over four factorial. So uh, at 24, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, 24. And so we get 0 0.0966573, 0 0.9, 0 0.097, the answer is B. So that was kind of an interesting twist on Lagrange error bound where they give us a whole interval of values. So we had to find worst case here, but then we had to find worst case here too. All right, you guys can do the rest of the problems. We did at least half of them. I think more than half of them together. Um, this is a really good assignment, I think, for BC stuff. We don't have a lot.